The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled New Rules for BTK Inhibitors in CLL, Benchmarks for Evidence-Based Treatment Selection, Sequencing, and Safety Management. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash dpx860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. So good morning and welcome everybody. We're very happy to see each other again in person here in lovely Vienna for the EHA meeting. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this symposium entitled New Rules for BTK Inhibitors in CLL, Benchmarks for Evidence-Based Treatment Selection, Sequencing, and Safety Management. My name is Stefan Stügenbauer. I'm from Ulm University in Germany. And it is my great pleasure to welcome our faculty, our esteemed colleagues, and dear friends, uh, Nicola Mana from Columbia University in New York, New York, and Paolo Ghia from Institut San Raffaele in Milan, Italy, who can unfortunately only join us virtually. Paolo, we are very happy to have you at least uh, linked to us here. Welcome. Now, without further ado, let's go into medias res, and it is uh, my pleasure to introduce briefly the topic to you with the title, Establishing Modern Rules for BTK Inhibitor Therapy in CLL. So, Let's focus on the topic here. Um, and honestly, when I see these cartoons, I'm always puzzled myself, because I have a hard time finding BTK in these signaling pathways. It's kind of hidden among many other molecules, and these signaling pathways are really complex, as you know. Nevertheless, targeting this single molecule, BTK, with BTK inhibitors, as you know, has revolutionized our treatment approach, not only in CLL, but also in other lymphoid malignancies. This may be due to the fact that this pathway is activated by multiple mechanisms, pro-survival mechanisms across different disease entities, and targeting BTK is the Achilles heel, so to say, of these survival pathways. Not without um, a reason, this has led to the approval of ibrutinib and acalabrutinib in the United States and in Europe for the treatment of CLL, and other agents, such as the covalent inhibitor sanobrutinib, um, are um, underway with regard to licensing. Of note, a novel class of non-covalent BTK inhibitors, such as pertobrutinib, nemtabrutinib, vecabrutinib, and phenobrutinib, are in clinical development, and these agents, as uh, Nicole will outline to you later, offer yet another dimension of BTK targeting for our patients. Now let's look at the guidelines, and this is um, an excerpt from the ESMO guidelines looking at the treatment recommendations uh, for patients with symptomatic CLL. And as you know, due to the editorial process, these, out, these ESMO guidelines are usually a bit dated when they appear. However, in all subgroups, unmutated IGHV, mutated IGHV, and the high-risk group with a 17P deletion or TP53 mutation, the ESMO guidelines do recommend um, BTK inhibitor-based therapy. In this older version, they also recommend um, chemoimmunotherapy, also for patients with unmutated IGHV, also there's evidence that efficacy is decreased in that subgroup, and I'm pretty sure that in the next revision of the ESMO guidelines, things will move further towards targeted therapy and away from chemoimmunotherapy. A bit more forward-looking in, in that respect are the US guidelines, the NCCN guidelines, where you see in treatment-naive CLL patients, no matter if unfit, fit, or with high-risk characteristics, such as 17P or TP53 abnormalities, the preferred regimens in these guidelines are acalabrutinib plus obinutuzumab, plus or minus, uh, with or without obinutuzumab, excuse me, ibrutinib or venetoclax plus obinutuzumab, so chemoimmunotherapy is not recommended as a primary option here anymore. Now, despite these advances and the data that we have available, real-world um, analyses show that there is still work to do. For instance, a survey by the European Research Initiative on CLL showed that among over 5,000 patients with CLL, almost 60% in the real-world data still received chemoimmunotherapy as a frontline treatment. Similarly, in the US, the informed CLL registry showed that 40% of patients with unmutated IGHV still received chemoimmunotherapy, although we have clear evidence that efficacy is decreased in that subgroup. 
Furthermore, one third of patients with 17P minus or TP53 mutated CLL did not receive NCCN recommended regimens. Moreover, there are currently challenges with BTK inhibitor therapy, and these relate particularly to toxicity. In real world surveys in the US and um, in Europe, it was shown that about 40% of patients discontinue treatment with the BTK inhibitor, in this, in this case, ibrutinib, uh, early on. And in the majority of cases, this is not due to disease progression, so treatment failure, lack of efficacy, but due to adverse events. Also, long-term data from clinical trials, in this example here resonate too, show that after a treatment duration of uh, about six years, 53% of patients have discontinued ibrutinib, and the major reason for discontinuation of treatment here were adverse events. So what about selectivity and the relation of selectivity uh, and tolerability of treatment? In the kinase plots uh, on, the, on the top left here, you see the comparison of the covalent BTK inhibitors, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and sanobrutinib uh, with regard to target specificity. And it is pretty clear from the display here that acalabrutinib is the most selective, the most target specific agent. Similarly, pertobrutinib, uh, kind of the role model for non covalent BTK inhibition, is also a very selective uh, drug targeting almost exclusively BTK. It has been shown in clinical trial data that less selective BTK inhibitors, e.g. ibrutinib, have more of target effects and therefore may contribute to more toxicity, in particular in long-term treatment. There's rationale that off-target effects are related to toxicity because other kinases targeted by these agents, such as TEC and AGFR, are responsible for the classical side effects we see with ibrutinib treatment. Now, another challenge on treatment is obviously the emergence of resistance to therapy. And as you see in the cartoon on the left, next to other events, mostly adverse events, disease progression, as displayed in the gray curve, over time is a major reason for discontinuation of ibrutinib therapy. In the right cartoon, you see that the majority of patients who, after longer-term use of ibrutinib, become resistant to the drug have mutations of either BTK, the, tar the drug target, or the immediate next downstream signaling molecule, namely PLC gamma 2, as relevant resistance mechanisms. So the mutation of the target cysteine 481 um, in BTK, where ibrutinib, but also the other covalent inhibitors bind, is a relevant resistance mechanism. And to that end, it is not surprising that other BTK inhibitors, such as pertobrutinib, have been developed that do not rely on that specific binding to cysteine 481 um, in BTK. However, although these agents have been shown to be active in C481S mutated uh, CLL, other BTK mutations have been found that confer resistance to these non-covalent inhibitors. For instance, when you look at the heat map at the lower right on this panel, you see that ibrutinib resistance is found in BTK C481S, but other BTK mutations have been found to confer resistance to these non-covalent inhibitors. So resistance development may be a problem also with these agents in the longer run. Last but not least, as we use non-chemotherapeutic agents more and more, i.e. not only BTK targeting, but also BCL2 targeting with venetoclax, the problem of double refractory CLL is an emerging issue. And in this real-world analysis, among 382 patients who discontinued these treatments, it was found that discontinuation of immediate next subsequent therapy, or death, time to that was only 5.5 months. So clearly, there's an increasing clinical challenge of double refractory CLL to both targeting agents that have provided such great breakthroughs. Now, against this background, um, it is our task in this session to have a clinical consult session based on patient um, displays and discuss with you uh, the upfront treatment strategy, selection of BTK inhibitor therapy, including in high-risk settings,
we will discuss the sequential use of BTK inhibitors and how we will use these agents as compared to other treatment options available in the future. And throughout, we will have a case discussion uh, in, in the talks by each of our two faculty members outlining the treatment principles, in particular looking at the situation in Europe as compared to the US in our practice for CLL management. And with that, I would like to hand over to Paolo. Paolo, I hope you can see and hear us well and are able to show your presentation. We are really happy to have you available here at the symposium, at least virtually. Paolo. So thank you. Thank you, Stefan. I hope you can also hear me well and see me well. And uh, indeed, thank you for this very nice introduction. And uh, don't relax too much, because during my case presentation, I will ask a question to you and Nicole. So I want to hear the opinion on both the sides of the uh, ocean and see what, how you would behave uh, uh, with the, the case I'm going to present. And uh, indeed, uh, I, I want to present a, a case of a gentleman, an and old gentleman, 75 years old, with uh, uh, symptomatic CLL in particular due to anemia below 10 grams per deciliter. Um, the remaining features are nothing extraordinary. We had the largest lymph node the patient had were, uh, was uh, four centimeters. He had some comorbidities, the one that you would expect in an old gentleman, uh, diabetes and the well-controlled hypertension. So let's keep that in mind also for the future. And then, we, of course, we did uh, a, the genetic uh, characterization, and the patient turned out to have a, a, a CLL with unmutated immunoglobulin genes, but the, from a fish point of view and um, also from uh, uh, the study of the P53 gene, didn't have much, so only a deletion of 13Q. So patient, elderly patient, unmutated immunoglobulin genes, few comorbidities, the reason to start treatment, anemia. Uh, anemia due to the infiltration of the bone marrow in this case. We ruled out, of course, the hemolytic anemia. And uh, so what we are going to discuss, as you already put it very well at the beginning, uh, how would you treat such a patient with continuous BTK inhibitor, with a fixed duration venetograft plus obinutuzumab? Of course, given the topic of this session, you didn't uh, um, stop too long on this option, but this, we know that this is also another possibility nowadays available in many countries. And then we want also to discuss uh, a little bit further again uh, if there is any potential role uh, for chemoimmunotherapy in such a patient. And uh, uh, you already put it very well, uh, but uh, we have uh, an overwhelming now uh, evidence that continuous BTK inhibition as uh, uh, it is also the title of this uh, symposium, it somehow became the benchmark, the standard of the treatment for uh, a patient with chronic deposited leukemia, also for the simple reason that this is, uh, the, uh, this is the class of drugs for which we have the longest follow-up at the moment. In particular, the resume 2 where ibrutinib was compared in first line in elderly patients to uh, chlorambucil, uh, um, to chlorambucil. But then we have also ibrutin associated to um, obinutuzumab. And in many, in all, I would say, all clinical trials, uh, ibrutin alone or in combination uh, was shown to be superior in terms of PFS and sometimes also overall survival uh, to any type of immunochemotherapy has been applied. So FCR, BR, or uh, chlorambucil alone or plus uh, obinutuzumab. The same holds true uh, with the second generation BTK inhibitors, uh, acalabrutin and zanobrutin, a little bit shorter follow-up with the elevate TN. Actually, now we reached uh, the five years uh, follow-up that uh, has been presented at ASCO and, uh, um, and it, shows, it keeps on showing a superior progression-free survival compared to chlorambucil plus uh, uh, obinutuzumab. And uh, more recently at ASH, we, we saw the results uh, with uh, a two-year follow-up uh, of the sequoia study where uh, zanobrutin monotherapy continuous treatment was compared to bendamastin plus ituxima. And again, uh, BTK inhibition showed to be superior to uh, immunochemotherapy. The longest follow-up, as you already mentioned, and up, actually everybody uh, appears to be um, aware uh, from your first survey, 
is that uh, in eight years of follow-up, the Resonate 2 study where uh, elderly patients with CLL have been treated with ibrutinib or chlorambucil, um, uh, it shows uh, for the first time that uh, we can really maintain a long-term control of the disease with the continuous treatment with BTK inhibition. And in particular, uh, up to eight years of follow-up, we had not yet reached uh, the median progression free survival, which is something that, of course, we never uh, saw before in uh, um, CLS history, I would say. But this is, again, as I mentioned, uh, it's becoming evident with any uh, BTK inhibitors, and that is the first one is uh, acalabrutinib. As mentioned, uh, um, Jeff Sharman uh, presented at ASCO the five-year follow-up, median follow-up of uh, almost 60 months, 58.2. And uh, as you can see here, uh, roughly more than two-thirds of the patient, almost uh, uh, three-quarters of the patient still respond, do not progress uh, uh, to acalabrutinib monotherapy in green, um, and if you add uh, obinutuzumab in uh, the, the, the red-purple line, then you have even a higher uh, benefit, 84% of the patients still responding after five years of follow-up. We don't even look at the chlorambucil plus obinutuzumab curve because uh, we know that this is definitely, uh, if we are planning to use that drug, and if we, because we don't have availability of novel drugs, then we have to be aware that the efficacy is very, very limited in time. And again, as you, Stefan, also pointed out very well, and it is reported in all uh, guidelines, uh, the unmutated patients have the same advantage as mutated patients uh, in terms of immunoglobulin genes. And therefore, uh, again, the continuous BTK inhibition somehow eliminated the difference uh, in terms of prognostic risk between mutated and unmutated patients. As mentioned, also the sequoia, we, we have resu results with zanobrutinib. The, the study is uh, much younger, so we have only uh, two years of progression-free survival, but the story is uh, very similar. So in blue, you do see the patient treated with uh, zanobrutinib compared to uh, the yellow curve uh, patient treated with bendamastic plus ituximab. Of course, this study did not include patients with the deletion 17P or P3 mutations, because these patients should never be treated with immunochemotherapy. And uh, here we do see uh, the dramatic uh, advantage uh, and benefit for patients treated with tanoglutin compared to bendamastic plus ituximab. So again, also bendamastic plus ituximab should be probably uh, uh, not uh, utilized anymore in patients uh, with chronic lymphocytic leukemia if, of course, you have uh, um, novel therapies available. Uh, yes, uh, as, as I mentioned, we, we, we have, and, and this is, uh, we have to, to talk about also the, uh, the other possibilities, which is the use of BCL2 inhibitors, and uh, um, as we know, and Stefan, you know very well from the CLL14, a German CLL study group, uh, study, uh, mm, venetoplast can be used in a fixed duration fashion, uh, uh, one year of treatment uh, uh, together with uh, obinutuzumab in the first six months. We have uh, a four-year follow-up, and uh, Osman Al-Sawaf will present the five-year follow-up at this meeting, and uh, uh, the results are also very impressive because uh, uh, there is an advantage in terms of PFS compared to, again, uh, chlorambucil plus obinutuzumab, and hopefully this is one of the last studies where we are looking at uh, patients treated with chlorambucil plus obinutuzumab. It is always uh, losing against uh, all novel therapies. Estimated for real progression free survival is 74%, uh, percent, so three out of four patients still uh, responding. So the median progression free survival has not been re yet reached. We might discuss uh, later on uh, on the differences, potentially, potential differences between the different subgroups of uh, uh, patients with CMN. So this is our patient. I just remind you, elderly 75, uh, reason to start treatment, uh, um, uh, CLL uh, um, infiltrating bone marrow and giving anemia, uh, diabetes and hypertension, uh, maximum four centimeters of lymph nodes, and in particular, unmutated immunoglobulin genes with the normal P53 locus. So 
according to the guidelines, as you very well put it, uh, uh, continuous BTKI uh, with a gluten or a CALA, because these are the two that are approved, uh, at least in the US and in Europe, as we are here in the EHA Congress. Or the other possibility also is the fixed duration with the NATO plus plus one two. Definitely no role for chemo immunotherapy. So, uh, Stefan, Nicole, Nicole, Stefan, uh, how do you see that? Uh, we, have, we have still two different options. How would you um, consider these two treatments, in particular, taking into account that the patient has unmutated monoglobulin genes? Uh, so typically, I, I would prefer the BTKI therapy, although obviously, uh, you know, certainly fixed duration is very well. Uh, but you have to consider, you know, the patient is older. The, the problem of the venetoclaxobinutuzumab is there's no doubt that at, at least... In my practice, uh, you definitely have to talk about the labor intensity in the beginning of the venetoclax obinutuzumab, and, and most of my patients do react to obinutuzumab despite pre-medication. So I, for an older person with a high white count or it, big nodes, uh, particularly in this patient, uh, the nodes are under five centimeters, but his white count is high. I would admit this patient. Uh, luckily, I have the the ability to do that on the leukemia service. So, so if we're gonna do fixed duration in this individual, you just gotta keep and monitor for tumor lysis and keep a close eye. So it's not that you couldn't do fixed duration, um, you just need to, you know, sometimes the ability of the patient to be monitored and come back and forth to the medical center has to be taken into account. And if they're unable to do that, then this is probably not a good idea for them. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, the continuous BTKI and in particular, uh, with the unmutated, I tend to favor that, and it's an easier regimen to do for this individual. But certainly, fixed duration could be considered as well. What about you? Well, we didn't yeah. we didn't uh, coordinate this before the session because we wanted to have it spontaneous. And usually, I hate to uh, be of different opinion uh, compared to our smart and uh, charming Nicole here. But I mean, for the sake of the discussion, I have to do so, isn't it? Um, we remain friends, obviously. Um, so being, Always. you know, European, being European, <laughs> I, have to f I have to favor the fixed duration treatment, do, don't I? I was just pointing out uh, the fact that you have to be careful. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't blame you of malpractice if you say that uh, there's infusion-related reactions with obinutuzumab. That can happen, even in Germany, that may happen. Uh, no, I mean, seriously, we know, we know that early on we have difficulties in administering obinutuzumab yeah. and with the venetoclax ramp up. But in my opinion, in the long run, this effort that you have to take early on during treatment pays off because when you compare the, the, over, the, the progression free survival curves also for unmutated IGHV patients, and Otman will show those at this meeting, you see this that with this one year fixed duration treatment, um, you achieve after six years of follow up almost the same, if not the identical outcome as compared to six years continuous treatment. So to me, one year of a bit more effort, and actually it's not a year, but it's only the first days, isn't it? Uh, a bit more effort, and then five years of therapy is of, of great value. And as long as we don't have head-to-head -head comparisons, I think it is a very individualized decision. We actually didn't patient. disagree. Oh, you didn't? No, we didn't. Ah, okay. We were good. agreement. So, I was just saying you got to pay attention to yeah, the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Before this is becoming it's a too, choice. Before this is becoming too boring, because we all agree, we let Paolo go on and see what he was doing. Paolo. No, but actually, what it comes down to is indeed at a certain point becomes really the, the patient preference, uh, and and uh, and also as, as Nicole very well put it, uh, the the local arrangement. I mean, maybe she's so lucky that she can admit patient easily in her uh, unit. In many other situations, that's much more difficult, and indeed, it can create some troubles. Just the fact that you have to uh, set up an appointment and so on and so forth. So that those are probably technicalities that are not anymore scientifically um, relevant, because as you said, uh, uh, all treatments that we have available are uh, definitely very good for our patients, and definitely better than uh, immunochemotherapy. So, having said that, I move on and make it a little bit more difficult now. Uh, this patient had also hypertension. Um, I just remind you, the, though it is uh, well controlled, and now we add another extra piece of information, which is uh, a creatine clearance of 45 ml per minute. So is that going to affect your decision or not between continuous BTKI, fixed duration, venetoclax, or again, maybe the immunochemotherapy is uh, resurrected? 
So uh, I just want to remind you indeed that uh, we, we spoke and uh, Stefan already introduced the fact that uh, uh, many patients might not well tolerate well, in particular in the long run, uh, uh, the continuous treatment with BTK inhibitors, in particular those of first generation. So uh, I brought in it as a, a paradigmatic example. And I just make a summary here, but we are all aware of the the common toxicity that can affect patients treated with ibrutinib. So uh, we know the classic uh, clinical uh, uh, complications like atrial fibrillation, bleeding in particular, and minor bleeding, though of course we are all afraid of the major bleeding, uh, which are fortunately rare. Um, hypertension is also um, particular uh, after a uh, few years uh, of treatment can indeed uh, increase. Um, we can have diarrhea, which is typically mild. Uh, arthralgia, as we will hear also, we heard already uh, in the introduction, can be an issue uh, in particular to maintain the patient on treatment in the long, in the long run. Other toxicities, uh, uh, which are uh, um, um, probably uh, can be found also with many other drugs, uh, can be dermatological changes like uh, skin rash, fatigue, uh, or cytopenias, uh, and in particular with ibrutinib, uh, uh, there is the possibility of, uh, uh, though very, 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 very rare, I, we have to say, but of ventricular uh, arrhythmias. In, um, this is uh, uh, absolutely summarized and visible in all uh, studies where ibrutinib was uh, involved. As you can see here, again, recently to illuminate and so on and so forth, uh, uh, all the American studies, Alliance, ACOG, and uh, UK study flare, and you can see that uh, how frequent uh, the um, different uh, adverse events can occur with uh, uh, atrial fibrillation uh, um, being uh, quite uh, uh, frequent, in particular accumulating with time, also because the patients are getting older, and therefore, by definition, also uh, elderly patients have a higher risk of uh, uh, developing atrial fibrillation. Hypertension, you can see the numbers as well. Uh, infections, I never point out uh, uh, too much attention to an infection, meaning that it's not probably class-related infection. is always an issue that can occur with uh, when we treat patients with uh, CLL, and, uh, and therefore we have always to be aware of infection, uh, regardless of uh, uh, type of treatment and, uh, and treatment itself. Um, the, with uh, uh, the second generation BTKI, um, in this case, we are looking at acalabrutinib and the elevated TN or zanobrutinib uh, in the line below. We have immediately the impression, and we will see a little bit better the, the results in a head to head comparison, that atrial fibrillation appears to be lower uh, and less frequent uh, in, uh, with both drugs. And uh, uh, acalabrutinib also shows uh, also a lower frequency of uh, uh, hypertension, which seems very, very close to uh, background. Uh, bleeding uh, uh, is still there, uh, minor bleeding, uh, but uh, uh, also in the case of acalabrutinib, it seems decreased compared to uh, ibrutinib. The, here we have to remember that the follow-up with acalabrutinib is longer than the one with zanobrutinib. So, in summary, and this is, I take the opportunity just to remind everyone, uh, uh, given the risk of bleeding with the BTK inhibitors, uh, uh, it is not recommended to give warfarin together with the BTK inhibitors. Not really because we know that it's so detrimental. The fact is that uh, all patients treated with warfarin were always excluded by all studies involving a BTK inhibitor. Uh, always remember to do a cardiac evaluation in your patient before starting treatment with BTK inhibitors, in particular to follow up the patient during the treatment so that you can um, realize and diagnose atrial fibrillation when occurring or any other arrhythmia in case. In um, patient, uh, you have to inform in advance of the risk of bleeding so that the patient don't get scared. I mean, as I said, most of the cases are minor bleeding and not, really, not life-threatening at all, but the patient, of course, can get scared because it looks um, dramatic. Um, in the case of a calabrutin, the patient can um, complain of a headache, which is typically transient one or two months uh, at worst, uh, and uh, usually they don't need to take anything. 
but or otherwise it can be managed with uh, anti-inflammatory drugs or even just simple coffee. And um, you monitor neutropenia, in particular with xanobrutinib. Neutropenia is also an issue with venetoplast, we may see later on. And then as usual, as a general rule, good rule, uh, monitor for infection and secondary malignancies in our patients. Uh, regardless, I would say, the treatment, regardless of BTKI, always keep in mind that that can uh, occur. So as I mentioned, we have a head-to-head -head comparison between all these uh, BTK inhibitors that may help uh, finally to understand something, having so many molecules now around. And the first study is the Elevate RR uh, relapsed factory, whether a calabrutinib was compared to uh, ibrutinib in a non-inferiority study in terms of efficacy. So the primary endpoint was non-inferior progression-free survival, and that was indeed confirmed and met. So has a ratio 1.00 no differences in terms of progression-free survival. So what is more relevant to our discussion here today is uh, the secondary endpoints that were mainly uh, safety endpoints, and uh, in particular, there was no difference in terms of uh, um, frequency of uh, uh, Richter transformation or infections, but there was a, a significant difference in terms of frequency of atrial fibrillation. Always remember that this is a, the cumulative uh, um, frequency over almost four years of follow-up. Uh, here we have uh, 9.4, uh, so 9.4 percent of atrial fibrillation in uh, uh, calabrutinib arm compared to 16 percent in the ibrutinib arm. And in addition, when uh, we look at the results, uh, though they were not uh, endpoints in the study, calabrutinib showed to be superior uh, in terms of. Uh, less hypertension and less minor bleeding events. Major bleeding events remain uh, similar. Here I just show you the curve of uh, uh, the cumulative incidence of atrial fibrillation and hypertension, uh, just to show that uh, um, the, the, the calabrutin curves are, tend to be flatter. So it, it, these curves give the impression that indeed that with ibrutin, you have somehow a peak and increase uh, of uh, uh, both atrial fibrillation and hypertension at the very beginning of the, uh, of the treatment in the first six, uh, 12 months. And then uh, uh, probably the, uh, the cumulative uh, incidence uh, becomes the same due to the age of the patient. Uh, in, uh, I'm also showing here what we call the nuisance adverse events. Um, so they are not definitely life-threatening or uh, clinically cumbersome, but of course they are uh, Patients are, may complain uh, about these, and again, diarrhea and arthralgia. And again, you see that, that there is somehow an initial increase, uh, um, major increase uh, in the first uh, three months, and then uh, um, the two curves become similar. But that is really suggests that the uh, ibrutinib is somehow associated with the increase of uh, frequency in both diarrhea and arthralgia. In, um, with the Alpine study, we are, uh, um, danobrutinib has been compared to ibrutinib in the relapsed refractory setting. Again, in the elevated RR study, only patients with deletion 17P and or deletion 11Q were uh, enrolled. Um, here, instead, all patients with the relapsed refractory, but that doesn't really make a lot of difference. The primary endpoint was the efficacy uh, uh, in terms of overall response. Difficult to assess, uh, meaning that the overall response included uh, mm, not, that did not include partial responses with lymphocytosis. So the, um, there is a difference, 78% versus 62% compared to ibrutinib. But again, if you consider the partial responses with lymphocytosis, the difference was not so uh, high. Uh, it is also becoming also a difference in PFS. Uh, it's becoming evident, but here the follow-up is only 12 months compared to the Elevate uh, uh, RR study uh, with uh, Acalabrutin that was almost four years. So we might wait a little bit longer to see how the situation is going. And uh, again, a second generation BTK inhibitors, also with Zanobrutin, we did, they did see a difference, uh, um, a positive difference, meaning an advantage in terms of less uh, atrial fibrillation or flutter with tanobrutinib compared to uh, ibrutinib. In um, 
Of course, we also want to remind uh, about venetoclax. Venetoclax, uh, we know because of the risk of tumor lysis syndrome, uh, is much more associated with the renal impairment since our patient has a problem with renal impairment now. And uh, I just want to remind you that uh, um, when the patient has a reduced renal function, we have to be a little bit more intensive and uh, proactive, let's say, in the tumor lysis syndrome prophylaxis. Uh, but at the end, we don't need to ne do any dose adjustment uh, until very low level of uh, clearance. clearance. So now we have the patient uh, here, um, the hypertension, I just remind you, and uh, somehow an impaired uh, renal function. So again, both options, uh, BTK inhibitors and venetoclax, uh, fixed duration venetoclax remain viable for this patient, but uh, at the end of the day, you have to pick one. So again, Nicole, Stefan, how would you, is that changing your opinion? Are you shifting uh, chair? Are you struggling now? I think we have so much consensus that we don't change our opinions. <laughs> Not yet. We wait for your further elaboration of the case, Paolo. <laughs> Okay, so this is not really affecting you indeed uh, also with uh, such creating, creating clearance, which is, uh, I would say, not unheard of in elderly patients with CLL. Again, uh, you should be careful of uh, providing a very good hydration in the patient in case you want to start with phenetoclox. Uh, of course, it's not an issue at all for patients uh, if you plan uh, to treat with BTK inhibitors. Okay, now we make it difficult. Now I want to see Stefan jumping on the table. And uh, uh, the patient that now, unfortunately, unfortunately, we send the samples to Ulm University to have the patient retested. And the patient was indeed the P53 mutated because uh, uh, Stefan Stingerbauer is performing NGF analysis and not Sanger. And indeed, we have 17% of positivity, so really at the, at, the, at the threshold of sensitivity of the Sanger uh, sequencing. So what is the optimal choice here? Continuous BTKI, fixed duration, or do you think ever to use immunochemotherapy? You are all aware, of course, uh, uh, the data about patients with high risk CLL, but in particular here we are talking about patients with P53 aberrations. Just want to remind you that P53 aberrations in terms of deletion 17P, because again, the, 17, the, the short arm of the chromosome 17 is where the P53 gene is located. If we lose that chromosome, we lose also the P53 gene. But the, thing, the same applies to patients who have only the point mutation in the P53 genes that is inactivating the gene. So we know since a long, long time, that uh, patients with deletion 17P died earlier. Why is that? Because at that time, we didn't have anything else than immunochemotherapy, and the patient with an abnormalities in the P53 gene do not respond to immunochemotherapy, so they were dying, simply dying, because we could not control the disease. Everything changed again thanks to the BTK inhibition, to the continuous BTK inhibition. Here is on the right side is the phase two study run at NIH by Adrian Wiesner. Six years of follow-up, you look at the yellow curve, the PFS, progression-free survival, we have 61% of the patients with P53 aberration that are still responding, not progressing. So somehow, again, uh, eliminating or, or, or decreasing the prognostic value of the P53 aberration when using the BTK inhibitors, in this case, was ibrutinib. The same thing appears to be true when you look at patient with, uh, uh, look at patient with P53 aberrations treated within clinical trials, randomized clinical trials. Uh, here is a pooled analysis. On the left side, we are looking at the P, uh, progression free survival four years, uh, and uh, it's uh, 79, so four patients out of five still responding after four years, and the overall survival on the right. Uh, almost 90% of the patients still alive. So something very dramatically different in terms of uh, perspective for our patient with P53 aberration if compared to immunochemotherapy, which I remind again, should never be used and, uh, in patients with P53 aberration.
The same story holds true in patients with uh, um, treated with the second generation BTK inhibitors. Here is a calabrutin elevated TN, treatment naive. I remind you, elderly patient uh, treated with either chlorambucil plus obinutuzumab or a calabrutin plus or minus uh, obinutuzumab. And uh, here we have uh, again the data at five years presented at ASCO by Jeff Sherman. And uh, we have 71% uh, of the patients still responding. The interesting point is that here we do not see any difference with the addition of obinutuzumab in these subgroups of patients, as indeed uh, obinutuzumab is also working by inducing apoptosis in the leukemic cells. And since these cells don't have a P53, a functional P53 gene, then the cells cannot activate their apoptotic cascade, and therefore there is no advantage in adding uh, obinutuzumab. Again, venetoclax is also, uh, uh, as uh, Stefan will confirm uh, at this meeting in the six-year follow-up of uh, his uh, pivotal study, uh, venetoclax is also a very effective therapy for patients uh, with deletion 17P, definitely in continuous treatment, as it will be showing, but uh, we are going to discuss here about the fixed duration. In the fixed duration uh, uh, regimen, like in the CLL-14 study, it seems that patients with deletion 17P uh, progressed earlier. And uh, in particular, uh, some patients really progressed during, uh, even during the therapy or uh, right after stopping the therapy. So maybe indicating that uh, uh, the, such a fixed duration treatment might not be the best uh, for our patients, but this will be open to discussion in a few minutes. Uh, of course, these are all, stu all studies, uh, um, um, all the results seen in clinical studies. We uh, have now the first uh, uh, results from uh, real world. Anthony Mati published a couple of months ago this study showing that uh, real world comparison of patients with the deletion 17P treated with ibrutinib or not. And uh, um, with, with ibrutinib, uh, with or without deletion 17P. And uh, as you can see here, he shows a little bit of a difference. Though the follow up is still short, the numbers are small. So we have to really see in the future if this is all, all is true. But definitely, this is much, much better anyhow than any chemotherapy that uh, is available. So, um, are we going to improve if we add more drugs to this category of patients? So if we add, for example, both uh, um, ibrutinib and venetoclax, this has been um, evaluated by us together with Bill Gilda and uh, Constantine Tam in the captive study, in particular in the fixed duration cohort where patients were treated with uh, all patients with CLL, young patients in particular, were treated with three months of ibrutinib to debulk the patient followed by 12 months of the combination of ibrutinib plus venetoclax. In that study, we uh, selected out the patient with the high risk feature uh, meant to be either unmutated monoglobulin genes or P53 aberration. If we look at, at the right side, uh, we can see that the progression-free survival of the patient with unmutated monoglobulin genes in blue is very, very reassuring, 96% uh, at, 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 two, at two years, and that's uh, identical to what we see in patients with mutated monoglobulin genes. But if we look at the green curve, so patients with deletion 17P and or P53 mutation, still very good, 85% of the patients responding after two years, but less than patients with unmutated monoglobulin genes. So this is something that is somehow disappointing, and maybe the fixed duration remains to be explored uh, uh, differently in the patient with P53 aberration. Maybe we have also to look if and who are the patients who are relapsing, those not achieving undetected MRD, those achieving it, uh, we will see with more detailed analysis. But just to tell you that patients with P53 aberration might remain a little bit challenging subgroup uh, when thinking about fixed duration treatment. And this is something that indeed the Germans' uh, uh, colleagues in the CLL2 give, took already into consideration. So they started smart with a, a triplet combination, ibrutinib, venetoclax, obinutuzumab, and then they, which is a time limited therapy, but then they didn't stop at all uh, completely the, the treatment, but they continued the uh, ibrutinib. So that's 
was probably a smart, a smart idea because they know what uh, we are dealing with when talking about patients with deletion 17p and p limitation. So now we are looking at a figure of progression free survival at two years of 95%, so, uh, which is very similar to what we have seen for unmutated patients before for the fixed duration treatment, but because indeed these patients continue ibrutinib. So, uh, of course, here we would like to see if and uh, how ibrutinib alone would compare to, um, to, this, uh, to the use of a triple combination. But the idea is really that there is a lot of caution by all the investigators in um, treating these patients with high risk feature, and in particular in stopping the treatment once for all. And then also the novel uh, BTK inhibitors are also uh, now in the play, in the game, and acalabrutinib has been uh, also associated in the triplet uh, by Mark Davids in the AVO studies, acalabrutinib, venetocasopinotuzumab, treatment naive CLL patient, they achieved a um, very similar level of undetectable MRD also in patients with P53 aberration and uh, unmutated immunoglobulin genes. That was also true in the Captivate study with only Ibuti plus Penetoclax. So we know that we can achieve very deep responses, but the problem is that we cannot probably maintain them in the long time, time in the long run. So we want to see, of course, uh, long PFS before we can really be uh, reassured that we can use fixed duration in the P53 patient. And Matt Davids now started another trial, the MAGIC phase three, where a fixed duration treatment, uh, AV, uh, acalabrutinib plus venetoclax is compared to venetoclax plus obinutuzumab, which is a standard in fixed duration. And uh, at the end of uh, roughly one year of treatment, the patient will be randomized based on the uh, level of MRD so those who achieve undetectable MRD will stop the treatment and follow up. Those who do not achieve undetectable MRD will continue uh, either treatment until, uh, uh, until progression. So with that, uh, we go back to our patients and uh, I would like to hear uh, Nicole and Stefan opinion again. Is that really changing the, the decision? I tend to give fixed duration for my patients with high-risk disease, um, so it doesn't change. The data supports that. Uh, clearly, I, I mean, at least the oral-oral combinations are a little bit more encouraging than VEN-G in the 17P and P53, but you're right. I'm worried that, you know, the, until we have longer follow-up, the PFS curve, we might not be able to sustain them. So currently, I continue therapy. Right. I mean, as you, as you have outlined, uh, Paolo, we, we have um, evidence that with VEN-G fixed duration treatment, uh, in particular the group with the 17P deletion and or TP53 mutation fares worse. Um, we have a bit of a lack of similar analyses sometimes in the BTK inhibitor trials. Nevertheless, uh, based on the evidence that we have, possibly for that subgroup, um, um, a, a continuous therapy uh, appears beneficial. Um, nevertheless, a caveat here is that we always do these PFS1 comparisons. Um, and while when you fail a continuous therapy and have your PFS1 event, uh, this treatment option is obviously gone. Uh, if you have that PFS event, let's say, after one or two years of therapy with a fixed duration treatment, you can retreat. So PFS2, after repeating the same treatment, would be an option. And the majority of patients with on VENG with a 17P deletion do not progress with that one, within that one year of treatment or within the first year of follow-up. So I think, uh, yes, there is a tendency to use continuous therapy. Uh, quote, unquote, you can also consider continuous venetoclax in that population mm -hmm. as another okay. option. Um, and until How we have to give it. <laughs> and uh, until, uh, until we have head-to-head um, uh, -head comparisons, which are underway, for instance, with the CLL-17 study and in the U.S. as well, I think we, we have to base the decision on individual patient characteristics, as you have outlined. No? And we were commenting remarkably how well these patients are doing now, even with these therapies, compared to what they did. So, you know, here, taking that population and five years later, they're still doing remarkably well. Mm. We'll just see how long in the fixed duration when they are then retreated, how long, as you said, that response dur durability will be with, you know, re-challenging either with the same therapy or combination with, you know, BTK and VEN again. So we'll see what those, those clinical trials show, but very encouraging. <laughs> 
Yes, yes, indeed. What we are missing, uh, Stefan, very well put it, uh, is data, long-term data, in particular the, 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 the sequencing data and the retreatment data. So that's what we are all looking for. Okay, so having said that, I, I see that when uh, we enjoyed too much our time and therefore we are running out of time, BDK inhibitor definitely uh, have become and are a main pillar of current CLL treatment and in particular for P53 patient maybe remain the most uh, reliable at least uh, um, uh, treatment at the moment. Uh, BDK inhibitors uh, um, are uh, um, somehow eliminating the differences between the different uh, genetic subgroups in CLL and the second generation BTKI, BTKI are helping to improve patient compliance and toler tolerance to the therapy. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I, let's see what Nicole has to say. And uh, thank you very much again, Paolo. You probably cannot see it, but we, we do have a full hall here and uh, probably uh, even more people following online, so there should be a couple of hundred uh, people also joining online. So uh, really, really great um, uh, to see you all here. Thank you again, Paolo. I think, you know, we, we again have consensus on the podium here that uh, we have enough time to allow for questions. So if you here in the hall uh, have a question, a burning question, please step up to the microphone. Um, we also have some online questions. Yeah, microphone three, please, go ahead. Maybe you can bend it down a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got it. So, uh, this is uh, Lin Wang from uh, Philadelphia. Um, so I have a question. Uh, you know, first of all, that's an excellent uh, discussion. Uh, you know, that case uh, illustrate all the, you know, the, uh, the current principle uh, very well. Um, my question regarding if uh, everything being equal. And uh, like, uh, you know, do you consider like, uh, you know, the burden of a blood disease versus a, a nodal disease, if that change in the patient, do you push you one way or the other, BTK inhibitor versus a BCL2 inhibitor? Okay, very important question. Paolo, you, Paolo, you got the question? Yes, 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 indeed. So I have to say that that never uh, enters uh, somehow the, um, my algorithm of decision, meaning that first of all, in Europe compared to to the U.S., um, the we were uh, um, we had no obligation uh, to hospitalize patients based on the high, the risk of uh, um, the tumor lysis syndrome risk. So that uh, uh, was a feature that was not really impacting the decision we were treating and we are still treating uh, uh, all our patients in the outpatient clinic uh, when we plan to use venetoclax. Um, so really, uh, I think that the, the, the bulky uh, disease or the quantity of disease is not really impacting my decision and I will choose based on what we said so far, the data, the genetic features of the disease, the, the age of the patient, uh, uh, the tolerability, and in particular, what I think is uh, what is m much more important, I think, is the comorbidity profile uh, that uh, of the patient that is driving my decision. Beside the genetic features, of course, the P53 story, and so only variable is uh, uh, the leukemia burden versus uh, the nodal uh, yeah. burden. So, in that case, how do you choose? You know, sometimes if a patient has profound cytopenias and I really need to quickly get those blood counts better, um, then oftentimes, believe it or not, I may add in the antibody first. Um, it doesn't mean that you couldn't do fixed duration. You absolutely could. But if you need a quick count recovery, you can do it that way and then add in the venetoclax. Um, you know, we know that the, certainly the BTK inhibitors take more time to improve the leukemic burden in the bone marrow. Um, and so if somebody has profound cytopenias, I mean, certainly you can use an antibody with the BTKs as well. So those are rare circumstances where you need to get an improvement in their blood counts and then you can add in the BTKI. And, and that works great also for autoimmune cytopenias as well. So you can add in the antibody and then add in the, the, the targeted therapy shortly thereafter. So that's where you might be a little, you might, depending upon what the needs of the patient are, you might be a little selective that way. But there's ways to get around that. So mm -hmm. certainly you could probably use either agent depending.
Cool, okay. Any other burning question? I mean, we have a, we have a Q and A session at the end, and we will have some polls and things at the <coughs> end again. So maybe in the interest of time, Nicole, we go on and uh, move to your talk. Thank you again very much, Paolo, for the excellent overview. And uh, we move on to uh, uh, Nicola Mana, who will uh, address uh, again the, the safety issues and sequential treatment issues. So similarly, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, we're going to go and use these cases as an example to evolve with some of the data. So here we have Barbara. So she's 65, and she's on therapy with a Brutinib. Uh, comorbidities include COPD. She has an unmutated IGHV, and she has some uh, painful joint inflammation after one year on treatment with a Brutinib. This resolves after dose holding, and she's given some prednisone as well. But uh, the inflammation recurs, uh, and she has joint pain after restarting a brutinib at 280 milligrams. So what are the potential options of therapy here? Uh, can you do additional dose adjustments, switch to a next generation, a calibrutinib or xanabrutinib, or switch to venetoclax? So we'll talk about some of this data. Um, so interestingly, there are obviously we have a lot of our experience with the brutinib and gaining more experience with the next generation of calibrutinib and xanabrutinib as well. This was a composite uh, publication by Steve Coutre, who will be missed sorely by his colleagues and his patients. Um, but this was uh, looking at Resonate, Resonate 2, uh, as well as the PCYC 1102 and 1103 data compositely over 300 patients. And you can see that 38% of patients discontinued therapy. Um, and 16% of those were due to progressive disease, and 11% of those were due to adverse events. The majority of these were grade one, grade two, uh, mostly diarrhea um, and fatigue. The grade three, four adverse events tended to be um, more actually neutropenia and infectious complications with pneumonia. And as this was shown earlier um, the, in the Resonate 2, so now when you think about this, we have the, obviously the longest follow-up in patients on the abrutinib studies now eight years out. And the majority actually, well, not the majority, but 47% of those individuals are still on therapy um, now eight years on abrutinib. But 53% of those did discontinue uh, therapy. And as you can see here, about 23%, a quarter of those patients uh, discontinued due to adverse events um, and less so due to progressive disease. There was another uh, uh, report looking at, again, real-world data. Obviously, clinical trials of patients are a little different, self-selected, uh, attend uh, you know, the clinical trials, and they're followed, obviously, intently. And, and certainly, there's always a difference between the clinical patients on clinical trials and real-world. Uh, so certainly, this was a, a looking at a, a large set of patients, about 145 patients on abrutinib therapy. And those who had more comorbidities, of course, that they were noted to have a difference in their event-free survival and over, overall survival. So you could see here that, and this was measured by the SEERS score. Um, so looking at those individuals had a, who had a high SEERS score over seven, their overall survival at 24 months was reduced at 79% compared to those with less comorbidities um, at 100%. And similarly, those who had more comorbidities um, discontinued therapy more frequently than those who were more fit. Um, so you can see that uh, those who discontinued were greater in the patients who had a higher SEER score. Now, in this setting, then, for patients who are uh, imbrutinib intolerant, there were two reports looking at patients going on to other uh, next-generation BTK inhibitors, such as a calibrutinib and xanabrutinib. And so this was the report by Kerry Rogers at Ohio State looking at a small cohort of patients um, who went on to uh, go on to receive a calibrutinib after they developed some intolerance to a brutinib. And here, the, just to look at efficacy, um, not to expect that it would be differently, but the overall response here was 73% with an 8% CRCRI rate. So efficacious, the median PFS not reached, the median overall, overall survival not reached approximately 80%, whether at 24 or 36 months. But when you look at the then intolerance and what patients did after they were on a calibrutinib, you could see on the left-hand side the number of patients with imbrutinib intolerance and the classical BTK intolerance issues, AFib, diarrhea, rash, bleeding, arthralgias, and that was the total on the left. For those then that went on to receive a calibrutinib, the incidence of their intolerance um, were uh, less frequent, and also if they recurred, were at a lower grade typically um, uh, than what they were with a brutinib. <clears throat> 
Similarly, there was a report with xanabrutinib, again, a little bit more immature data, but in the setting of either a brutinib or um, a calabrutinib intolerance, you can see here from the orange curve of the 66 or brutinib intolerant events, the majority of those, 88%, did not recur. For the small number of patients who were on a calabrutinib who had an intolerance, two um, did not recur, one and two recurred, one at the same rate and one not at all. So similarly, you can re-challenge patients on a, an alternative BTK inhibitor depending. Now, what about the use of venetoclax in abrutinib intolerant patients? And, and of course, we have more data in this setting uh, with venetoclax. And this was a, a report by uh, myself and colleagues looking at venetoclax, actually given as monotherapy. And this was early on report of of venetoclax in the multiply relapsed refractory setting um, with uh, after abrutinib. A median number of prior therapies was four, and half of the patients had a deletion 17P. So an extremely high-risk patient population. And here the overall response was 70%. So again, another option for patients after abrutinib intolerance. So let's go back to Barbara again. She had the joint pain. Uh, that resolved with prednisone, and uh, but certainly recurred after dose lowering of her root nib, and then uh, the possibility of next steps. Uh, obviously, you could do an additional dose adjustment to 140 milligrams, but this may not work, and and, and I don't know. We can ask uh, Stefan and Paolo if they would actually do that. Um, or you could switch to a more selective covalent agent, which we kind of went over that data, either a calabrutinib or xanabrutinib, depending. Or you could certainly change to an alternative drug glass, such as venetoclax, um, which has a different AE profile. Stefan, would you, would you, would you switch? Would you, would you dose reduce again? Right. So probably, um, you know, as we have alternatives available, I wouldn't go lower with the abrutinib dose because uh, there is some evidence that this may uh, impact on efficacy. Um, among the other two options, you know, I mean, you've shown the data. There is a remarkably high number of patients who tolerate acalabrutinib well, uh, despite coming off therapy uh, with abrutinib for for AEs. So probably I would like if there's benefit to remain on one drug class and, and switch to uh, the second generation compound instead of you know, switching to the other, um, so BCL2 inhibitor type um, uh, treatment, because then, you know, you have used both weapons that you have in hand in this, in this patient. Uh, probably I would switch to another BTK inhibitor in that sense. Yeah, is Paolo online too? We should certainly tap him in. So would it depend on the type of AE that could occur? What if it was something more severe? Right, so not all AEs are created equal. So let's say somebody had a uh, CNS hemorrhage, for example, would you switch, would you go to a, a next generation, although obviously the bleeding incidences are decreased, but is that something, or would you switch class altogether? I agree with you. I try to keep the same class going before, you know, maximize the class, but, but I think that it's, you know, a good point to bring up that, again, not all AEs are equal, and you need to consider that as well. Absolutely. I think uh, you've shown the, the outline very nicely. I mean, there are AEs that are clearly decreased even in head-to-head -head comparison with acalabrutinib as compared to ibrutinib. Uh, the cardiac events and hypertension are, are the key things, while others like, uh, you know, the diarrhea um, are not so much changed. So indeed, looking at the specific AE that caused discontinuation or dose reduction is also informative, sure. Absolutely. Uh, so now let's change the case a little bit. So what happens if Barbara progressed? So she, uh, same comorbid COPD, she's unmutated, um, but she was treated with venetoclaxobinutuzumab as her frontline therapy. She developed some neutropenia, which was managed appropriately with some dose reduction. She achieves a remission after one year of treatment, and then after three years, returns to the clinic with progressive lymphadenopathy. So what are the possible choices now that she's um, uh, progressed after venetoclaxobinutuzumab? Could you use a covalent BTK inhibitor? Can you re-challenge with venetoclax or use a different class altogether, such as a PI3 kinase inhibitor? So obviously, this has been shown as well. Um, clearly, in the relapse refractory setting, uh, you have many choices uh, for TP TP53 and deletion 17P. You can use a brutinibacala, ven, retux, um, as uh, the category one, and then you have venetoclax alone, abrutinib retux, uh, idella retux actually in the relapse setting, and allogeneic could be considered in fit patients. 
Now, also, dur duration of remission after time-limited therapy might be important, and we'll learn more about this with longer follow-up and durability from some of the studies. But short remission duration, less than 36 months, you can challenge with a BTK inhibitor, then retox again, uh, using venetoclax-based therapy again. Longer remission duration, certainly you can repeat the frontline therapy or change to a BTK inhibitor. So we're going to go through some of that data. In the U.S., we do something similar, of course, um, but we've also included xanabrutinib, although this is not yet FDA approved yet for CLL, but under, uh, will hopefully soon be soon. And regardless of age or comorbidity, certainly BTK inhibitors uh, and venretux uh, can be used in the patients with TP53, uh, similar uh, BTK inhibitors and venretux would be recommended. So let's go a little bit to the data here. Here's the phase three resonate data. This was abrutinib uh, versus ofatumumab in this setting, and you can see obviously um, the PFS benefit favoring the BTK inhibitor versus ofatumumab. Here the PFS uh, was 44.1 months versus eight months with ofatumumab, and you can see the overall survival at 67 uh, versus 65% for the two arms. The ASCEND data that was recently updated at ASCO just recently a week ago, this is the uh, four-year update, um, and again, continued uh, PFS benefit in the acalabrutinib arm versus this is a study that allowed investigator choice between idolisib rituximab or bendamustine and rituximab. And you can see here now at 42 months, the median PFS uh, for the acalabrutinib was 62% comparatively to idolisib rituximab in the blue arm at 23%, and then bendamustine and rituximab um, in the green arm at 5%. Now, what about um, can you, what about in, in this setting, what about the use after venetoclax about BTKI? And so this was a retrospective study that we performed looking at these individuals. And certainly for BTK-naive patients, if you, if you haven't received a BTK inhibitor, the PFS um, in, this, in this setting is quite high and looks durable. But if a patient has already had a BTK inhibitor and then uh, progresses after venetoclax therapy to go, then go back to a BTK inhibitor, at least a covalent BTK inhibitor in this data set, um, the, the progression-free survival was much shorter. So this is generally not what we would recommend if they've already had resistance to a BTK inhibitor by going back to a covalent BTK inhibitor. Now, the Murano study, of course, we have, you know, maturing data, uh, and this is a time-limited approach, as many of you know. This is 24 uh, months in the relapse setting with venetoclax and rituximab, and very highly active. Of those patients who then required subsequent treatment after progressing, um, this, remember, this was a randomization of venetoclax, rituximab, mm -hmm. compared to bendamustine and rituximab, and you can see from the the curves on the left, uh, 26 or 27 percent had um, uh, required subsequent therapy, so 18 who were on the Ven rituximab arm, and then in the bendamustine rituximab, you could see 123 um, patients were in that arm. You could see uh, 59 percent required subsequent therapy. So then, when you looked at what treatments those patients received for those who had Ven rituxin and then went on to a BTK inhibitor, uh, the overall response was obviously very high at 100 percent. For the patients on the, ben, the, the Benda rituximab arm, the overall response with a BTK inhibitor in that setting was 84%. So certainly after relapse, requiring retreatment um, from Ben Rituxx, um, for those who, the few patients who required subsequent therapy, certainly a BTK inhibitor therapy is a choice. What about re-exposure to venetoclaxobinutuzumab? And this is what we were talking about. So, so Matt Davids has a trial called Revenge uh, or Rechallenge with venetoclaxobinutuzumab. Uh, so these are patients who already got venetoclaxobinutuzumab in the frontline setting um, and achieved a clinical response. Um, they have to have a minimum of one year uh, progression-free period after completing that frontline therapy and, and obviously have evidence of progressive disease. And they can be randomized to one of two cohorts. In the cohort one, they've had at least two years between their last dose of their frontline therapy with venetoclax. Um, and then the study treatment will be six cycles of venetoclaxobinutuzumab with then six cycles of venetoclax as monotherapy. Uh, for patients in cohort two who have a shorter duration durability since their frontline therapy with venetoclax, they're going to get longer therapy. So they're going to get six cycles of venetoclax or venetuzumab and then 18 cycles of venetoclax monotherapy. And so obviously the primary endpoint will be overall response rate at that time period. <laughs> 
So to go back to uh, the Barbara, so she progressed after primary venetoclax, uh, obinutuzumab therapy, um, uh, and so what can you do after that? So the use, we just showed you, the use of a covalent BTK therapy is certainly an option and supported by some of these current guidelines and data that we have. Rechallenge with venetoclax is obviously um, currently being explored in some of these studies, but certainly possibility of an option and considering, depending, I think also, and we can talk about this, is the, dur you know, the duration from their original frontline therapy with ven obinutuzumab, and then, of course, uh, alternative options, different therapies. Stefan, would, would you guys, let's talk about maybe Palo. What, what would you do in this setting uh, for somebody who's progressed after ven obinutuzumab? And we can change the scenario around to depending yeah. upon what, how many years post-therapy. So um, after three years after the completion or after the beginning? You could, yeah, how about this? You could say you could you could do three years. No, after ju I, just, I want just to make the point that we are really correct. Uh, we are we are navigating unexplored waters, but I want to say one thing: that uh, if we use a fixed duration treatment, one reason to choose a fixed duration treatment is to give the possibility to the patient to be retreated with the same treatment. Otherwise. Uh, I think that uh, uh, there, is, there is an advantage, of course, in the fixed duration per se, but the major advantage is the fact that you can continuously, hopefully, reuse the same drug for at least another uh, time, if not more. So that's why I would try anyhow to rechallenge the patient with the same treatment. If it is after three years, after the beginning of the therapy or after the completion of the therapy, of course, it would be even better if it is three years after the completion of the therapy because it means that it's four years after the, the start of the therapy. And I think that more or less three years is what we would all consider um, viable as an option to, uh, to restart re the same type of treatment. If we are talking about, as you very well put it in your clinical trial, below one year, maybe it's a risk. <laughs> Uh, between one and two, we will see. Uh, but still, uh, even in that case, I would always try to see what the effect uh, of, uh, of a rechallenge would be because uh, uh, you never know, uh, indeed. It might be only that uh, the patient, even if you, if you progress uh, shortly after stopping a therapy, it might simply due to the fact that the patient uh, needs a continuous treatment rather than uh, a... Um, a fixed duration treatment, so you might use again venetoclast, but keeping uh, continuously. Of course, that depends also how, which type of access you have to the drugs. So uh, it really depends on the different market, the different country. In Italy, for example, there is at the moment no options that you can retreat the patient with the same treatment, so we have to see. Stefan, would you, if it was less than a year, would you do the same therapy? Probably if uh, the treatment-free interval was less than a year, I would be reluctant. Although, in these very early progressors, after all targeted therapy, not only venetoclax-based, but also BTK-based, I would very uh, worry mm -hmm. very much about uh, Richter's transformation and search for that with, you know, PET-CT scanning and, and uh, biopsy accordingly. Hmm? Fair enough. Okay, so let's go on. Now what about, now we're gonna switch up the case a little bit. So here she received venetoclax and obinutuzumab and achieves a remission after one year of treatment. Then as we just noted, she uh, returned with progressive lymphadenopathy after three years. She was initiated on a caliber nib. She had some headaches. Uh, they were managed and otherwise well tolerated. But then she developed progressive disease now after a caliber nib. So approximately five years uh, from her initial treatment more or less. So what are the potential options in this scenario? Should we sequence to another covalent BTK inhibitor, rechallenge with venetoclax at this point, use a different drug class altogether, PI3 kinase inhibitor? What about non-covalent BTK inhibitors? And of course, CAR-T, we could bring up ALO even, and, and others, okay. So this is becoming a new challenge, and this was already uh, shown before, but obviously uh, now we have a new term, a double refractory. Back in the day, we used to consider the refractory patients the fludarabine refractory patients, back, for those who still remember that. Uh, some of us are old enough to have treated those patients on FCR. Um, but the double refractory remains now a new challenge for us. So on, on this study here, you had uh, 300 patients who discontinued covalent BTK or BCL2-based therapy. 
And, and so obviously, clearly, um, their outcomes were poor. So uh, after both covalent BTK and BCL2, uh, subsequent line, 5.5 months. So clearly uh, something that we're going to be dealing with a little bit more commonly. Um, and and as, as was pointed out before, obviously, uh, patients can acquire resistant mutations, the most common being the BTKC481, but also we have PLC gamma-2 mutations, and there were others that were also shown to you all earlier. Um, and you can see that the, this applies to all the covalent BTK inhibitors, Acala, Abrutinib, and Xanabrutinib. So obviously, BTK resistance contributes to disease progression and diminishes the efficacy of the covalent BTK inhibitors. Now, we're going to talk now about the non-covalent BTK inhibitors, and, and clearly the, the nice little cartoon on the left shows that the covalent BTKs just require wild-type BTK for activity because they covalently bound to C481. And the non-covalent BTK inhibitors, and we're going to talk about it's not just pertubrutinib, obviously there are others in development as well, does not require the C481 to bind to the kinase domain, and this can overcome that C481 resistant mutation. So this is just happens to be the one that's further along in development. This is pertubrutinib. This is from the Bruin studies. Myself and colleagues uh, looked at this in patients who had uh, relapsed uh, pretreated CLL. Uh, either they had BTKs, they didn't have to be all refractory to BTKs. They could have had just progressive, uh, they could have just had uh, toxicity or intolerance. Patients also notably had, uh, many of them had prior BCL2 based therapy as well. And the overall response across the board was approximately 68% in all comers. And you can see the nice waterfall plot um, comparatively compared to baseline and how well patients did. Um, in the double refractory, since that's the, the, the section that we're talking about right now, so patients who had failed prior BTK plus BCL2-based therapy, these individuals also did okay. So the overall response was similarly in the 68% range for this individuals, and of those, 100 of these had prior BTK and BCL2-based therapy. So certainly a potential option for those individuals who are uh, double refractory. This is not the only non-covalent BTK inhibitor. We saw data from uh, Jennifer Woyak at ASH looking at nematabrutinib, um, which also nemtabrutinib, I, I always put in an A, nemtabrutinib, uh, who is also um, obviously a little bit more immature data, but certainly the overall response in these 51 patients uh, was about 58%. Uh, and remember, 63% uh, of those patients had a BTK C481S mutation. So again, looking forward to more uh, longer term follow up with this non covalent BTK inhibitor as well. And then just switching gears a little bit, we'll talk about CAR T cell, which has clearly obviously evolved. Um, as you know, there are approvals in the non Hodgkin's lymphoma patients and obviously ALL patients as well. Um, but we're going to look at this in, in CLL, which the, it has sort of come. Uh, come full circle, uh, I, I, we started this many, many years ago uh, in CLL patients. Uh, so hopefully at some point this will get FDA approval for CLL. But here in this um, Transcend CLL 004, which was uh, presented by Tanya Siddiqui, these were patients who were, had failed or were, or were ineligible for BTKI-based therapy. And if they had high-risk disease, and this was defined as patients who had complex cytogenetic abnormalities, deletion 17P or TP53, or unmutated IGHV, they, they, were, they would have had to have failed at least two prior therapies. For standard risk patients to be on, on this uh, study, they had to have failed at least three prior therapies. In the patients who were double refractory, I'm just going to note there, this is the prior uh, BTKI with abrutinib and venetoclax. You can see, again, small cohort of patients. There were 23 patients in total in the study, but 15 of those 23 were the patients that were double refractory. In these higher risk patients, you can see that the, the, there was a nice overall response at 82%. Um, and so this is uh, certainly another potential option for your patients if available, um, given the double refractoriness and difficult to treat these patients. What you can see in the patients who were double refractory, uh, the median PFS was 13 months in the double refractory compared to 18 months in, the, in, the all, in all patients. Uh, so again, a um, median PFS 13 months in double refractory CLL patients. So certainly an option. So let's go back to Barbara again. So she had venetoclaxobinutuzumab, then a calibrutinib, 
uh, and then progressed after that. So certainly um, exposure to additional covalent BTK inhibitors is unlikely to be beneficial, so we would likely not recommend that. Uh, but rechallenging with venetoclax is being investigated, and certainly, as we just discussed before, depending upon how long her response duration was, and remember, she got VENG first, then after several years, then got a calibrutinib, certainly perhaps rechallenging uh, with VEN-based therapy is, uh, is an option for, for her. Um, the use of the non-covalent BTK inhibitors as we get longer-term data uh, from pertrobrutinib and the others, this may be an effective option as well. CAR T cell uh, certainly uh, is an option depending upon the availability of the center. Um, and then, of course, now we don't have a lot. We haven't talked a lot about PI3 kinase inhibitors, and we can. Um, you know, likely given the ascend date, if you want to extrapolate, because that's what we'd be doing, because the, the numbers on patients in this setting are just so small that we don't have a lot of robust data with PI3 kinase inhibitors here in the double refractory setting. Uh, but certainly it's a potential option, but if they're likely, if they uh, failed a covalent BTK inhibitor, the extrapolation would be that the response duration to a PI3 probably would be very limited. So you would still have to think of alternative therapy for this individual. So just to summarize the take-home points in this particular session, depending upon BTK intolerance, and again, remember, not all intolerances are created equal, you can certainly try an alternative BTK inhibitor. Uh, venetoclax-based therapy is active in BTKI refractory or intolerant patients, so certainly that's an option for your patients. Um, and BTKs are active and vice versa, are active after time-limited venetoclax-based therapy. So if you start with VENG, certainly you could be rechallenged, or you can go to a BTK inhibitor. Double refractory patients are uh, obviously a new challenge for us, uh, and clearly th there's going to be uh, more clinical trials looking at these individuals, and non-covalent BTK inhibitors are potentially an option, as we saw from the pertubrutinib and other data. CAR T cell, depending upon availability, um, but obviously clinical trials with another, you know, agents with novel mechanisms of actions. We got the bispecifics, BTK degraders, and others that are currently being evaluated. This is the kind of patient you're going to be worried about and think about what other therapies to offer them because their response durations are, are very limited after failure of both covalent BTKI and for uh, and venetoclax. So something that those patients uh, need to be. We need to think of salvage options for them. So we do have some online questions, and this is a great one for Paolo. Um, it, when choosing how to treat patients relapsed after venetoclax or benetuzumab, does level of MRD reached affect the choice of therapy? Would you re-challenge with venetoclax or benetuzumab versus changing and going to another BTK inhibitor? And I guess first we can say, you know, how many check MRD, but, but certainly, um, you know, what would the level of MRD influence the next option of therapy? Is Paolo on? It's a very good question, oh. and of course, there is no uh, data at the moment supporting any, uh, any decision. Again, oh, as, a, as a general spirit, uh, I, uh, of course, one would like to see that you reach the very deep responses earlier, so you feel more confident in giving the, the, the therapy again, but since we are improvising for, for the retreatment because we have no data, I think that first of all, it's, I think it's always a good option to retry again. And maybe uh, depending on the level that were reached earlier, maybe switch to a continuous venetoclax rather than uh, do it and again another uh, fixed duration treatment. Uh, maybe I would do it anyhow if the patient relapsed after venetoclax fixed duration maybe I would be more uh, um, uh, optimistic in giving the, uh, a continuous venetoclax. But again, it's, it's a gut feeling, nothing else. Good, great. Thank you, Paolo. I mean, we are a bit uh, tight regarding time. Nevertheless, we have people at the microphone, maybe short questions, and we try to give short answers. Yes, please, go ahead. Okay. Yes, Carolina Pavlovsky from Fundaleo, Argentina. Uh, very nice talk. I would like to ask, in patients who, uh, who have atrial fibrillation, Previously to the to the indication of the of the treatment, what uh, BTK would you recommend in an older patient? So I mean, typically, so meaning they had AFib to begin. Yes, with. atrial fibrillation. Uh, so if previously, I'm, sure. So if I'm going to do that, I typically will choose one of the newer BTK inhibitors because of that head-to-head -head data. So I'll either go to a calibrutinib or zanabrutinib. Calibrutinib, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. 
Very nice talk, very interesting. Thank you very much, Dr. Shihab from Doha, Qatar, NCCR, National Cancer Center. My question, our patient population of CLL is very different. They are very young, uh, age of uh, 40, maximum 50 years old. So what do you recommend treatment for this young group? Because for life treatment will be difficult in real life. So follow with MRD or do you recommend sh uh, shorter duration? Thank you. Um, right, so interesting point. Young patients, um, not much comorbidity. I mean, on the one hand, we have the ECOC 1912 data that show an overall survival benefit with abrutinib rituximab over FCR in that population. On the other hand, as you say, this will mean years and years, if not decades, of continuous therapy. Um, we had a lack of data in this young population with obinutuzumab venetoclax, but the CLL13 data that will be presented as a late break here at this meeting mm -hmm. fill that knowledge gap. So I think um, fixed duration or limited time-limited treatment has, uh, with the emerging data, certainly a role in this young patient population uh, who may benefit particularly much from, from being off therapy. And the updated with that and mutated younger even moves away more from chemo immunotherapy, yeah? Right. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, maybe. So, uh, and the combination between BTKI and BCL2 uh, inhibitor pro will become a standard for this type of population. Another option, indeed, Paolo, thank you. Maybe the other question on the microphone? Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Hi, Steph. Um, Paolo, Patrick Thornton from Dublin. Just with regards, you're re-challenging patients who have had venetoclax before. Would you look for resistance mutations to BCL2 inhibitors before re-challenging with venetoclax? Um, yeah, thank you, Patrick. Very important point. I mean, as there are the BTK and PLC gamma 2 mutations uh, as resistance mechanisms for BTK inhibitors, covalent BTK inhibitors, we have others, and we have seen these BCL2 mutations. Um, mostly, if not exclusively, on continuous uh, BCL2 uh, targeted therapy, and so far not at all among, uh, after time limited BCL2 based therapy. Nevertheless, before re challenging, certainly on the trials, uh, we test for these mutations, and I think we should do um, in general practice because we have a choice of other therapy Agreed. for these patients. Agree? Absolutely. And also because Absolutely. we have to gather knowledge, so this is important yep. at this point yep. really to learn as much as we can. Thank you, thank you. Is this a question on microphone one, or is that, yes? Thank you. Um, Rosario Custodiana from Argentina. I would like to know, what, with regards with those patients treatment, treatment naive that still uh, have um, infections before starting treatment, if in, this, in those cases, which uh, treatment would you prefer for the first line, go to a VTK inhibitor or to a VCL2 inhibitor plus uh, anti cd 20 uh, also with uh, low uh, and sure. IgG levels. Uh, fair enough. Um, so certainly, I, I think, unfortunately, those patients may, you know, have infections regardless of the treatment option. However, um, you might want to consider time-limited, uh, barring no other concerns for that, only because it's time-limited, and then, you know, hopefully that, that you know, chronic continuous BTK inhibitor therapy, you, you, we're likely to see ongoing infections, too doesn't say it, it, it means you can't have that after fixed duration, but certainly I think a time-limited approach might be better. Um, and then you can look at supportive therapies. I would certainly make sure patients are vaccinated uh, prior to therapy and the infection complications are controlled. The use of IVIG certainly is, a, is another possibility as well. Good, very Thank good. You. So um, unfortunately, I think uh, for reasons of timing, we, we have to bring this session to a close. Um, I would like, first of all, to thank all of you again for, for joining us here, um, all of you joining virtually on your screens at home or in your office. I thank uh, Paolo uh, Gia from Milan and Nicola Mana from New York, great faculty. Thank you all for attending this meeting and enjoy EHA. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerreview.com forward slash dpx860. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from AstraZeneca.